Hello, uh, my name is Neville Hogan and I was privileged to participate in the 1989 workshop on robots and biological systems. Now at that time, the idea of studying both robots and biological systems to gain insight was new and may have seemed naive. The fields seem so far apart. They rely on different background knowledge bases. They use different uh, mathematics, uh, they have different reliance on mathematical models and analysis, and they ask different research questions. But as the intervening decades have demonstrated, the synthesis of robots and biological systems is very effective, and th that workshop was prescient. The mere fact that biology presents working solutions to known hard problems, such as manipulation or locomotion, is a powerful inspiration for work in robotics. And conversely, insights about biology emerge from a growing understanding of the challenges of addressing these problems. Now, at that meeting, I presented work on the control of contact in robots and biological systems. And that's a good example of the convergence of robotics and biology. The challenge addressed is that of coupled instability. This problem surfaced in, the, in robotics in the late 1970s when robots were first applied to other than pick and place tasks. The issue is that a robot can be stable during free motion, but if you attempt to use force feedback to control the force exerted on a surface of an object, the system breaks into uh, unstable oscillation and can chatter and repeatedly impact the surface. In fact, uh, about a decade later, that problem was identified as one of the fundamental challenges of robotics. On the other hand, biology provides unequivocal evidence that a solution existed. Humans show no evidence of coupled instability and clearly uh, studying humans will give you some insight as to how the problem might be solved. The solution turned out to be found in energetic passivity at the points of contact. Passivity here means that although the robot or the human can produce power, the motions of the point of contact alone, say due to perturbation or contact on an object, cannot evoke continuous power and hence the system cannot uh, kind of induce in instability when interacting with a passive object such as any collection of masses or springs or dampers or kinematic constraints. So this is a strong result. And it turns out that human behavior, as far as we uh, uh, have measured, is passive even with active muscles. And conversely, uh, that's not common in uh, control systems. Uh, an important issue here is that this requires a different perspective from the signal and, informa and information processing perspective that dominates computation and control theory. We showed that by using a good practice controller design. This is uh, using the linear quadratic Gaussian procedure with loop transfer recovery, which at the time was uh, uh, state of the art and still is a widely practiced uh, controller design procedure. But that procedure exhibited coupled instability because it didn't uh, impose passivity. Now it's interesting that the weakness of the signal and information processing perspective persists to this day. And uh, this was shown in recent work that showed that null space projection methods fail to uh, ensure passivity and hence are vulnerable to coupled instability. To explain, uh, null space projection methods are used to manage redundancy in, in robots. That is the case when the configuration space of the robot has much higher dimension than the uh, task space of the uh, robot. And the idea is to project the task space into the configuration space and identify the space where actions will have no effect on the, on the task space. And it's a nice idea and it's mathematically well uh, well defined, but it doesn't ensure passivity and hence it's vulnerable to instability. Now, interestingly, uh, in the last month, uh, my colleagues and I have published a paper showing that a biologically inspired approach based on controlling mechanical impedance can prove equally effective at managing redundancy with a significant added benefit of ensuring passivity and hence coupled stability. So uh, another area of convergence between robotics and biology is found in the control of soft deformable objects. And that's, I know, a topic dear to the heart of Professor Dario. Conventional approaches to control rely on mathematical models of the object 
and frequently use optimization to identify the controller, either identify a forward path predictive control or identify the parameters of a feedback reactive control. But optimization is profoundly vulnerable to Bellman's cursor dimensionality. And models of soft objects tend to have very high dimensionality, things theoretically infinite. Nevertheless, biology manages Dexter's control of soft objects all the time. An example that colleagues and I studied recently is the remarkable human ability to strike a distant target with the tip of a whip. And remember that a whip is made of non-uniform anisotropic deformable material interacting with the compressible gas, air, up to the supersonic regime when the, when the whip cracks. Engineering models of this object are extremely complex. So how does biology do it? Well, mounting evidence supports the conjecture that human motor control is based on a composition of primitive dynamic actions and these emerge as dynamic attractors of the neuromechanical system. And I won't go into the details, but the idea is that these are uh, building blocks that can be used to compose behavior. A recent simulation study showed that a predictive controller based on dynamic primitives was able successfully to place the tip of a whip at a distant target in 3D space. To identify the control, optimization was used but the optimization converged in a couple of hundred iterations because all it had to do was uh, search the parameters of a limited number of dynamic primitives. So what this showed was that um, this biologically inspired approach of using dynamic primitives can reverse the curse of dimensionality. The same approach, uh, this, that is a composition of primitive dynamic behaviors can manage more mundane tasks. We recently showed that a low cost robot, this was Baxter by Rethink Robotics, could be programmed using this approach to perform the task of buffing a shoe. Now, this apparently simple task turns out to be surprisingly complex as it involves physical control of and contact with a deformable object, that's the cloth, closed chain kinematics, that's when two arms are used to hold the cloth. Contact and non-contact operations, the cloth may move into and out of contact with the shoe. And combining rhythmic and discrete actions, the buffing is fundamentally rhythmic, moving the cloth to where it has to, uh, the buffing has to take place is fundamentally discrete. Nevertheless, all of these pieces could be put together using this idea of composing dynamic primitives, which is a, 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 an approach derived from studies of biology. So a subtitle of the meeting in 1989 was Towards a New Bionics. And in my view, the new bionics is here. It's proving to be a very productive way to improve robots and understand biology. And I think it has a rich future. So thank you for listening and happy birthday, Paolo.